if you have your Bible and your bulletin, I'm going to read more text than it says, uh, which I decided about 10 minutes ago to do. But um, they're not going to sure appear on the screen because sometimes I remember to not take my mistakes out on our sound text. Sometimes. One for two in the last one minute. We're going to look at uh, Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. So I'm going to start in uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Moving to verse 21. For the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving it greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Moving to verse 31, but earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Moving to verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Moving to verse 31. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged that the spirits... Prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. I was supposed to pray before I read that. I'm going to pray now. Lord, we ask that you grow us up in the utilization of our gifts that the Spirit has given us, in love, and in our ability to encourage one another in the church. Amen. In verse 6 it says, And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, which means we're called to serve and to love this group. Corinthians is taken out of context all the time and not problematically so, but the context of it is to encourage the church, to encourage those who worship together to serve in the ways that they're good at, in the ways that the church needs, and that they're able to. Do you know 
what to do around here? Do you know that you're empowered to do that? For the glorification of God, for the serving of his saints, and that we might be a little bit better as a church. We often think, as Paul talks about, that some things are, are more important than others. We might think that the relative gift that I have of preaching, some of you are like, I'll say it's relative. That's all right, just keep that to yourself, is more important than greeting someone at the door. And Paul gives a little bit of a hierarchy of gifts, but he also goes out of his way to say, the things we can't see are indispensable. My hand is visible, but my gut is more important to my long-term health. And when someone walks in the door here and they don't know where to go, which is not unique to our building, it's essential that a kind person goes up and greets them. It's essential that we give you the words to sing and be led by those that are gifted in it. It's, I could go on and on and on. There are about 40 different teams at this church of about 175 people that do things, and I hope you know where you fit in. And more importantly, I hope that you know that it's important. Did you know that a two-year-old can learn things about God? That means that there is no greater role because that's actually the gift of prophecy. When Paul talks about prophecy and desiring to prophesy in the text, especially in chapter 14, he talked about it also in chapter 11, he's not trying to give an overall biblical definition of prophecy. He's talking about your potential to prophesy to other Christians, which means almost exclusively building them up, encouraging them, and comforting them. So sometimes when you're sitting with a friend who's mourning, the way that you prophesy with them is by saying nothing, especially if you are about to say something trite. old friend of mine is telling me a story about a friend of theirs who lost a spouse. And they said, but maybe it's like you were eating chicken all your life, and now you're going to switch to beef. And my friend said, and I couldn't stop myself. It's like I was watching as I was such a miserable comforter to my friend. And my friend told me the story in a much funnier way than I'm telling you the story. I couldn't stop laughing because of how awkward it was. Prophecy is the ability to comfort and build one another up in light of the gospel and the word of God. Paul talks about miracles and healing. And then he just kind of moves on. He doesn't explain as much as most of us would want him to explain about how are we supposed to approach those things. So we go to the book of James, we go to the book of Timothy, the book of Acts, and we see that the apostles and the disciples and the people of God in the first century had hope in miracles and in healing, and they kept an eye on expectation, which can become real dangerous with respect to those things. You know what I mean? We live in that tension where we ask boldly, where we anoint with oil those in need of healing, and we don't wait to take wise steps. In the book of Timothy, Paul talks about two different people who are ill and how they need to take the steps available to them in the world. I actually made this mistake in 2009 and it was very unwise. I waited on a medical condition because I thought, my faith is so strong. Who knows what God will do? And that is good. And I had our elders annoy me with oil and pray over me and that is good. But delaying my surgery was stupid. Or to use a biblical word, foolish or unwise. So when Paul references miracles and healings, we accept the New Testament's overall teaching that we hope and we ask boldly and we don't act foolishly. Paul then goes on in chapter 12 to use this incredibly elaborate metaphor designed to inspire the church to serve one another. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong. Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Talks about the parts that we can't see. And then he says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Paul is teaching them that they're called together to serve one another for the common good. And the common good is not some generic political slogan, although that might work. It's designed to encourage the church to love and care for one another with the various things that you're good at. I'm so tempted to say your spiritual gifts instead of your spiritual gifts. 
your spiritual gifts. Serve one another with what your mind and your hands and your heart and your circumstances have led you to be good at. One way of understanding the New Testament is as a very large, interdependent, whole answer to Cain's very, very haunting question. Remember what he asked in Genesis? Am I my brother's keeper? And the New Testament answers that in 20 different ways, from the parable of the Good Samaritan to Jesus creating the the church in Mark chapter 3, describing spiritual family as those who come together to, he doesn't give it this, not as elaborately as what I'm saying right now, but he begins the conversation in Mark chapter 3. And then here, Paul reminding them that they're all essential to the love and worship of God and the care of one another. So I hope that you know where you fit in this imperfect church in the hills of Connecticut with, I go back and forth between wondering if we have too many things going on or not enough things going on because of our size and relative resources. Do you know where you fit? I hope so. And do you know that you're essential? Whether your gift is an upfront gift or a behind gift, whether it's one that involves lots of talking or no talking, it's essential. We are empowered for the common good. Sorry, I changed my outline over the week. Didn't tell anybody. In my notes, it says we are empowered for the common good, which grows us up in love. Paul begins his definition by description in chapter 13, talking about the things that would be impressive to do or to say in church. He says love is way more important than being impressive. Paul talks about the efficiency, the potential efficiency of the body of Christ in in at least borderline sarcastic language at the expense of love. Love is for the other in ways they can receive. If that sounds like a vague definition to you, fine. But we're for the other, but they need to be able to receive it. Love without wisdom can do a lot of harm to self or to the other. Love needs to be able to be understood and taken in by the one we are trying to care for. It does involve choice. It does involve emotion. It does involve will. It does involve faith. Without faith in Jesus, there's no way that you're even going to try, much less succeed at loving the people in this room. And yet, that's the context of this. Right in between all of you are called to serve and here's how to learn to encourage one another is the definition by description of love. Love is for the other in ways they can receive. And friends, it is time for us to grow up in love. That's the point of the last section of 1 Corinthians Corinthians 13. It is time for us to grow up. It's time for us to beg the Holy Spirit for patience and kindness. It's time for us to beg the Holy Spirit to guide us away from envy, boasting, arrogance, or rudeness. It's time for us to beg the Holy Spirit to help us not insist on our own way, to lead us away from irritableness and resentment. Is there a greater regular wounding thing in marriage than resentment? It's time for us to beg the Holy Spirit to guide us away from it and to learn repentance and wisdom, but also to guide us away from those things and towards patience and kindness. The reason I mention the importance of wisdom is love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I love when this is read at a wedding. It reminds me of when people choose to dance to every breath you take, which is not a song about love, but about stalking. You would never give this advice to someone in a relationship. You should bear with anything. You should believe everything they say. You should forgive everything. That's actually true, but (laughs) it's not in there either. Forgive's not in there. That's in Jesus, not Corinthians. You should bear with all things. You should believe all things. You should hope all things. You should endure all things. You would never give that advice to someone. 
if someone said, gave a certain story, told you a certain story, and then read you this verse, you would say, I think wisdom means this verse um, probably means something else, depending upon the story, right? But if the context is the church, if the church is indeed the bride of Christ, if God indeed exists and has given us one another for very curious but clear reasons, then we learn to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things with one another. And this involves wisdom, it involves listening, it involves knowing ourselves, right? I went to a conference in 2014 and one of the speakers very compellingly encouraged us to ask a handful of trusted people about our blind spots. I asked my 16-year-old, who at the time was eight, and my wife in separate rooms at separate times, unbeknownst to one another, and they told me the exact same blind spot. That stung a lot to be for the other in ways they can receive also involves some self-knowledge, doesn't it? To love your children, your spouse, your parents. But the context for Paul is church. And he gives the definition by description in 1 Corinthians 13 that is encouraging to us in relationships with our siblings, parents, coworkers, spouses, and children. But Paul's context is in between gifts and orderly worship is love, which binds all these things together and actually makes them possible, which sounds so trite, except we're not going to do this well if we don't know how to be for the other in ways they can receive. One of the most regular pieces of advice I give to people when a friend of theirs is suffering is don't ask them what they need because they don't know, because they're exhausted. Instead, offer them something that you can actually give that's easy to say yes or no to. I know that because we've been through some stuff, I would say. Learned that from some good friends that knew how to model it. Love is for the other in ways they can receive. And it is time for us to grow up in it. So that the church may be built up. This is such a fun chapter, isn't it? Like 1 Corinthians 13 is so beautiful, isn't it? Do you know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14? Women shouldn't talk in church, which is weird because in chapter 11 he gave instructions on how they should talk. I was reading in the, in, I have all these giant study Bibles at home and they're good for lifting weights and for questions like this, they're just way too big. But that's why I keep them at home. And in it, um, a woman named Catherine Taylor writes this about Paul, and I think it's true. The ability to hold in tension scripture that we love with scripture that makes us uncomfortable or even angry is a skill to be sought by those who would be spiritually mature. Just as Paul makes no attempt to reconcile his disparate moods and statements, we must not seek to domesticate his writing through rationalization or avoidance. Rather, we stand before this writer as his first readers did, willing to learn, argue, listen, and respond with a passion equal to Paul's own. In chapter 14, Paul says, For God is not a God of conf- confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. People think three basic things about that. I'm going to give you three perspectives on that verse. One, some people believe that that verse in in connection with other verses throughout the scriptures is about the role of women and specifically the role of women in leading of a church. They ought not to take the office that I have. Other people think, and I just learned this, that this wasn't written by Paul. It was added later. I was shocked at one scholar who put this forward, who I like a lot but disagree with. Other people think that they were having a problem in the church of Corinth where in the middle of the sermon or in the middle of people encouraging one another, people would stop the service and ask questions that would be better attended to after the service. I personally think that's the best explanation of Corinthians considering the fact that in chapter 11, Paul not only describes women speaking but actually gives them instruction in how to do it. But there there are a range of opinions on it. And that's where this book is so lovely 
because it says some of the most beautiful things about the resurrection. There are two beautiful benedictions at the end of the book. We have this definition by description of love that we will see crocheted on pillows as long as people crochet things onto pillows. And we also have lots of verses that challenge us about the sanctity of our bodies and our sexuality, about how to treat one another, about church leadership, about the importance of the resurrection. My buddy Phil in Florida, when he preached on Corinthians, did it this way. Oh, come on, you all know that graphic. No, you don't? Okay, good for you. He even had his uh, person who does these things redo it with our, the not-so-great letters. And it's because it's a wild book that's keeping up with the Kardashians. For those of you that would never watch that, that's the graphic, keeping up with the Corinthians. And it's because the letter to the Corinthians, especially the first letter, in my opinion, takes all these turns and Paul just doesn't mind writing beautiful doxology in the midst of challenging texts about who we are in Christ and what that means for treating one another and being serious about our commitment to Christian morality. And wrestling with all of it is good for us. That's one. Catherine Taylor inviting us to be spiritually mature and to wrestle through what do we think about these things? What do we believe? How do they inform how we do church and life? And the reason is when people come in to church, we want them to hear the good news and understand how profoundly good it is. In chapter 14, verses 24 and 25, Paul says, but if all prophesy, speak comfort and uh, encouragement and building up words to one another, So if someone walks in and we're doing that, for us that's more like a Bible study because of the size of our church. Chapter 14, 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. We learn to use our spiritual gifts. We learn to love one another in part for those who are visiting with us to see the sweetness of the gospel and trust themselves to it for salvation and for life. It's also for us. Paul talks in verses 13 through 19 about the importance of encouraging one another. That's why we try and sing songs that help our minds and our hearts grapple with the gospel. That's why I work on this for about 10 hours a week. I could probably put something together in about two hours, but I want it to be clear. And some of you are like, you need 12. And that's fine. Maybe I do. And some of you are like, you're totally clear. Let me just introduce you to some other people that are done nothing. It's to... But it's to equip us, friends, because if you're a follower of Christ, this is how we're equipped to love God and love neighbor, not just here, but also out there, but specifically, 1 Corinthians, here to serve and love one another. And in doing and in learning to do so and growing in it, God is honored, neighbor is encouraged, built up, comforted. Chapter 14, and for all of the uh, challenges of exactly what did Paul mean by this and how many people were prophesying and how many people were speaking in tongues, this was after the service was over is what I think he's talking about. He wants all of them to grow in learning to encourage one another and build one another up and comfort one another using the gospel and the scriptures. That's what happens at our evenings of encouragement. Women have a list of questions and they encourage the people that are present with what they know about the with God life. That's what happens at our Bible studies. We open the text and we long to help ourselves and one another understand the words that we might be comforted and built up. And some of that involves conviction and sting but ultimately we're comforted and built up and encouraged by that. Chapter 12, learn to serve one another. Chapter 13, let us grow up in love. Chapter 13, learn the gospel and this text and how to comfort and build up and encourage the other people in this room with it. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for uh, this text that you breathed through Paul 
for the Corinthian Christians and for so many first century Christians and for us. We ask that you indeed grow us up in love for your glory, but also very much for our neighbors in our lives. And that this church might ever increasingly reflect your good news to those who are considering the gospel and to those who put their faith in it decades ago. Long, Lord, we love to, Lord, we long to honor you in our worship and community and our efforts of faithful presence. Would you empower us, strengthen us, give us wisdom, guide us away from all of those temptations of envy and boasting and irritability, resentment, and into the ways of love. Amen.